How are we doing this morning? Awesome. It's, uh, it's great to be with you. We've got uh, Pastor Nathan is away. Pastor Todd is on sabbatical, so you're stuck with me. <laughs> but um, here we are, two weeks after Easter. You've probably eaten all your turkey or ham leftovers. How's that uh, chocolate stash going? You're working your way through it. Anyone sick of cheap Easter chocolate yet? Like, okay, I just don't need any more of that. Uh, And I thought it would be fitting this morning to pick a passage from, we're going to be in John 21, a passage that likely took place about two or three weeks after Easter. And here we are, two or three weeks after Easter, two weeks, I guess. And uh, so we're going to be diving into that. And uh, the author of the book of John, his name's John, all right, uh, shocker, uh, he's, he writes at the end of chapter 20, he says, I've written all these things so that you might believe that, uh, that Jesus is Lord, and having believed that you might have life in his name, okay? And uh, that, that seems like that would be a good spot to end the book. Okay, all right, you know, Jesus came he did what he said he was going to do. He's, he's, you know, died for us, raised to life, end of story, mission accomplished. And then there's this other chapter tacked on in John 21 that we're going to be looking at. And it's as if John's saying, but wait, there's one more thing. And what we're going to be diving into is at the heart of this last chapter of the Gospels, there's a question that Jesus asks to every single one of us. And apparently, I looked this up, uh, Jesus asked 307 different questions, okay? So he loved questions. And this one, this final one, and maybe he saved the best for last, because he asks, do you love me? Do you love me? Not, uh, do you believe in me? Are you convinced yet? It's, where's your heart at? Do you love me? So that's, that's the ground that we're going to be covering today. Okay, and we're going to be looking at the life of Peter, as told by his buddy John, and uh, we are going to skim through some of some of the uh, the New Testament. So let me just give you a little bit of context. Okay, so um, Jesus arrives on this scene around thirty years old, and uh, in Luke five it documents how he's teaching the crowds, and he he wants to you know talk to as many as possible. So he's out on a boat. Uh, Peter and his friends have been fishing all night. They haven't caught anything. They're fixing their nets. He's just like, hey, why don't you, you know, get back in the, in the boat? And uh, they catch like a mountain of fish, okay, so much that the, the two boats were sinking. And, uh, and at the end of that little section in Luke 5, uh, it says that they left their boats, left everything, and followed him. And that was the start of a three-year journey for uh, 12, or sometimes, you know, there's 70, there's uh, different numbers uh, of people that they left to follow Jesus, okay? So they left their careers, right? The boats, the the tax collecting, all the different things, the families left their homes, and they just traveled wherever Jesus went. Can you imagine being on the front row seat to the greatest teacher in history, the greatest miracle worker of history. I mean, what an, what an interruption in your life to leave it all, but what a beautiful interruption. And you're just, whatever Jesus says you're trying to do, you're following along, you're learning as you go, you're seeing miracles, lives are being changed, people are forever impacted. You walk away after three years, these disciples are like, uh, man, we have stories that we could tell our kids, grandkids, we will never run out of stories. Okay, this is what John says, like, there, there's, there's too much to write down. And you can imagine the disciples having experienced Easter, where Jesus had predicted he would die, and they're like, well, what do we do with that? Okay, I don't quite know. We've given a lot for you, Jesus. Like, you sure you're going to die? And he says, yeah, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. They're like, I don't know what that means, but okay, I guess I'm here for it. Um, and then Jesus pulls off this miracle. He pulls it off, and they're like, he actually did it. Wow, we were a part of that. And they're, I mean, can you imagine this is the adrenaline of Easter as a disciple? You've just lived through the greatest moment in history with a front row seat, and then you have to figure out, okay, now what? <laughs> like, what do I do with this? What do I do with my life? 
And so we're going to pick up the story in, in John 21, verse 2, if you've got your Bibles, or we've got verses up on the screen. And uh, they decided, well, I guess <sighs> bills are going to start adding up here. We need some income. Maybe nice to like go back home, sleep in our own beds again. Like it'd be nice to just head home. And so it says, Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, these are different disciples, the sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples were together. Okay, so they're hanging out. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, Yeah, we'll go, we'll go with you. And this was not just like, hey, let's, you know. It's been a wild three years. Let's cast a line in the Jordan, like just kind of kick our feet back in nature. Uh, no, they, they were commercial fishermen that had left, you know, yeah, Peter, Peter and John Incorporated, whatever it was. Like they, they had left Jesus uh, to do this. Uh, sorry, they left that to go with Jesus. And they're back, okay? They're back. And their families are probably stoked that they're back. You know, we've had these boats sit, and we weren't sure whether you're coming back, but here you are. All right, get back out there. Get those fish. And, uh, and so it says they went out, got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Ugh! It wasn't kind of the homecoming that they were looking for, right? And uh, how many of you, hands up, you like fishing? Okay. I kind of would put my hand up. I See, I like catching, Okay. And there is a difference, okay, especially if you're on Shemong Lake, all right? It's hard to catch a fish in Shemong Lake, so if you know how, tell me. Uh, but uh, I grew up near Lake of the Woods, which is a famous lake that's got phenomenal fishing, so I'm a little bit spoiled when I go out on Shemong, and you're sitting there for, you know, three hours, four hours, haven't caught a thing. Some of you get, guys can relate, like, man, like, how about eight hours? Have you ever taken your kids fishing and haven't caught a fish in eight hours? Yeah, all right. It's awful. And here they are. They fished all night, haven't caught anything, and they are agitated and frustrated. Now, I think it's a good moment here to just pause, okay, and ask you a question. Here you are, or you're watching online, or listening. Are you agitated in life right now? Is there something aggravating you? Maybe, if you're in the shoes of the disciples... You've experienced the, the, the highs of highs, and you came back to your old life, your old way of doing things, and it's just not the same. Maybe, you know, young adults in the room, you, you know, you come here for university, or you've, you've headed out and you're back home, and, uh, you know, it's just not the same. When I went from uh, northern Ontario down to Toronto, where I met my wife, went to Tyndale, we had our oldest daughter there, and we went back home. I went back home. It's just, you know, everything's still the same. Like, a small town doesn't change that much, but it just was different. And here the disciples are. It's different. It doesn't feel the same. But they are aggravated and ag agitated by the time Jesus shows up on the scene. And maybe, for you, you're kind of annoyed with how life is turning out right now. And I was thinking about it this week. There may be a few different reasons why, right here, right now, you're aggravated in life. There may be um, choices that you made, okay, that you just kind of, life was headed one way, God was working on, on your life, and, uh, but there were previous choices that you had made that you now have to live with, even as you follow Jesus, okay? It could be that you had these moments with Jesus, and now you've kind of gone back to what you were doing, and... Uh, there's spiritual forces in heavenly places that are working against you, okay? It could be that, um, that you, you had unrealistic expectations for what life would be like, okay? Or it could be, this is kind of the question I want to leave sitting on our hearts, is that maybe just like these disciples who had had this incredible experience with God, they come home, and it's not what they thought. Maybe God wants to meet you in the middle of your disappointment because he does not want you to be successful at something that's not within his plan. Okay? The disciples, if you look in the New Testament, they never catch a fish unless Jesus lets them. <laughs> so that, that plan of theirs is just thwarted. You know, I was, I was thinking about um, yesterday... 
Uh, we had uh, 25 or so guys gather from Pathway at uh, one of the elders' homes. And we had different speakers sharing their wisdom on different topics like business and, and faith and marriage and friendship and all sorts of different things. It was, for those of you that were there, that's phenomenal. Um, it was really neat to be a part of. And uh, I just so appreciate there's a level of trust in each other that allowed us to get to uh, a space of vulnerability, people sharing stories, tearing up, um, just genuine encouragement and support. And maybe you've experienced uh, an environment like that, maybe in a small group, maybe uh, at a youth retreat, uh, which is coming up in three weeks. So if you have not signed up, get on that because the retreat's closing soon. It's going to be phenomenal. A uh, little plug there. You're welcome, Jackson. Uh, or maybe, you know, years ago you went to camp and you had this incredible experience with, with God, okay? You've had this moment or maybe years of closeness to Jesus and somewhere along the way it's, it's kind of faded, okay? Many of us have experienced those kinds of, of moments. And the thing is, uh, you never unlive those moments with Jesus. You never unlive moments at youth retreat, like last year when I almost died because I was kidnapped. <laughs> and uh, they dunked me into uh, freezing cold water, almost got hypothermia. Their plan, okay, they almost gave me a, a skullet, but they just shaved part of my face, all right? And their plan had been to take me into a cave near Bancroft, so going spelunking. They would all go in together, and then they'd leave me in there with nothing but an LED light ball to find my way out. And I'd just be just smashing against walls to try and <laughs> see my way out. Uh, true story, okay? That uh, didn't happen, thankfully. That would have been a different kind of farewell. Um, but where was it going? Youth retreat, okay. Um, open mic, okay. Uh, maybe you've been at youth retreat or some kind of experience where... Uh, there's just a rich, um, you're hearing stories of how God's shown up in people's lives, and there's tears, and you're hugging each other, and it's just beautiful. Like, how, how do you go home and, and not go back to life as it was? And that's what these disciples are doing, okay? They're going back, and they're agitated, because, here's, here's, here's what I'm driving at, okay? Why, why the big setup? Because Jesus wants to meet them in their frustration, and have a heart-to-heart -heart about what their future holds, okay? Jesus had called them, okay, back in Luke 5, and it wasn't done with them. So Jesus shows up on the shore, says, just as day was breaking, John 21, 4, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered, no. He said to them, cast it on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast it. Now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, so this is John talking about himself, which is kind of trippy, uh, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. Isn't this what everyone does swimming? Like, hey, I need my coat. <laughs> I'm going swimming. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards off. All these fish. And in the minds of the disciples, they're maybe having deja vu to three years before when they were first called when they had overflown boats again. And Jesus said to them, hey, you're going to leave this and you're going to come follow me. And as John tells this story in John 21, it's as like Jesus saying, remember when I called you to follow me? It's still time to follow me. It's still time to follow me. And this morning, if I may be so bold, I think God's still saying that. He's saying, remember 30 years ago when you had that experience at camp and you gave your life to him and you said, I want to follow you, Jesus? It's still time to follow you. Or maybe last year when you were in this dark, dark place, you are hit rock bottom and you're like, ah, God, I surrender to you. Guess what? It's still time to surrender to him, okay? It's still that time. 
so let's hone in on Peter for a second, because uh, you can only imagine what's running through Peter's mind as he hears from John, yeah, that's Jesus. Peter's like, oh man, there's all these fish, but like, I gotta, I gotta get to Jesus. And Jesus, let's a little bit, give you a little bit of context. Jesus has a long history with Peter. Peter's this guy uh, who's always, you know, the leader of the disciples. He's first in. Hey, let's go do this. He's the guy who jumps out of the boat to walk to Jesus. He's the guy that says, hey, even if all of you fall away from Jesus, like, I'm in. I'm your man. And Peter is also the guy that about two weeks earlier, right before Jesus was crucified, he's following along pretty closely. Peter ends up in a courtyard with Jesus and there's this charcoal fire. Some of you would remember it, okay? And people are like, is that you, Peter? You, you're a follower of Jesus, right? He's like, no. Yeah, you're, you're a follower of Jesus. We've seen you with him. No, what are you talking about? No, we have seen you with Jesus. You're a follower of him. He's like, I don't even know this guy, Jesus, you're talking about. Jesus would predict this. And... The rooster crows to signal daybreak, and Peter's heart just breaks and he weeps. And for the past two or three weeks, he's lived with that agony and embarrassment of having done something that he's just completely ashamed of. And that's what he's probably feeling. Even though he's met Jesus, they haven't really, you know, talked about it to this point since Jesus is raised to life. And so that's where Peter is. You know, I think about different embarrassing moments from my life and my responses when I'm ashamed. You can probably think of some embarrassing moments from your life. You guys have never had embarrassing moments, have you? No, no. I remember one from mine, uh, grade seven. Everything wild happens in grade seven. And uh, I was a a good kid. And um, at school one day, now just a little setup, uh, I was kind of the leader of my crew of friends, and I was later the student council president. It's kind of a big deal, right? Uh, there was like 10 kids in the class, so nothing much. Um, and, uh, but I was a good example, right? I was a good example. And this one day, my best friend's younger brother, okay, was standing in front of me, and we were fine. Like, there was nothing wrong. He was maybe annoying me a little bit. With no provocation, no preparation, I kick him in the gut. Yeah, yeah, I heard that. Oh, I didn't see that coming. Like, I literally kicked him. We hadn't even talked. I just kicked him. And then I walked off, enjoyed recess. Well, not enjoyed, but I went out for recess. And I'm I'm walking around, oh no, oh no, oh no, what did I just do? Like, what got into me? Don't get me wrong, you guys have done dumb stuff too, haven't you? Oh man, I was talking to someone after first service, like, yeah, everyone's kicked someone, especially a younger brother or something. Uh, So hopefully I'm not the only one. But in that moment, I'm like, what did I do? And Peter is thinking, what did I do? How do I make this right? Uh, this, this goes against everything that I stand for. I guess I should finish that story for you. So my teacher, he knew this would just kill me inside because it just wasn't like me. And he just let me stew with it all recess long, didn't call me in. Class starts, just lets it go. And about halfway through, he's like, Andrew, we need to chat. I'm like, oh, whenever someone says, you know, we need to chat, it's never good especially if it's your parent or teacher or principal. And uh, he just let me sit with that. We had a short talk. And I don't know, it took me about a week to come around like, wow, like, don't ever do stuff like that again. Learn my lesson. Um, but it sits on your heart, and you got to make it right. And that was Peter. So when there's 153 fish, well, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, here we go. It says, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, Last time the word charcoal is talked about in the Bible, the only other time is, you know, when Peter's at the charcoal fire in the courtyard there, with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter, Jesus is like, go back at the fish. Okay, all right, fine. 
go, went aboard, hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So they knew it was him. This was not some mirage of Jesus. This is Jesus in his resurrected body, eating, drinking with them. And notice this about Peter. I could go on for an hour here, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep it uh, on point here. Um, something Peter does, I think, is a great encouragement to us. Uh, there's 153 fish pulling on the nets that he's holding on to and his buddies. And Jesus is over there. He leaves them to go chase after Jesus. Okay? There's 153 distractions right now calling your name. And you can either hang on to them and be pulled in by them or you can leave them for Jesus. And it may be like it was for Peter, their source of income that's calling his name, I need that fish to sell at market to have income. And it's like Peter's saying, hey, income, your job is important, but Jesus is more important. Or maybe they're pulling on these nets, and everyone's there, all his friends, and Peter realizes, hey, my friends, people around me, my community is important, but Jesus is even more important. So what's distracting you right now in life? There's something. There might be 153 things that are distracting you. Don't let them suck you in. Sometimes you have to let them go, chase after Jesus. So he does that, okay? And then they have breakfast. And then there's this fateful moment for Peter where Jesus, it's almost like it doesn't say this, but hey, like Peter, um, we need to chat. Okay, we need to chat. And so they go for a bit of a walk. And uh, it picks up. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? It's not, Simon, son of John, why did you do that? What got into you after three years, dude? I've told you. I've told you. It's not that, right? It's not, oh, if I have to deal with you one more time, all right? It's Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? It's the voice of compassion, of disappointment, but calling him into something greater. Um, scholars have often wondered about what is the, what's the more than these part? What do, you, do you love me more than these? Uh, it could be the nets and boats and kind of his, his old life. Like, do you love me more than this stuff that, hey, you left for three years, but here you are right back at it. Do you love me more than this? Or do you love me more than these other disciples? Uh, you love hanging out with them, your buddies. Do you love me more than them? Or Peter, you said you were all that, and you were going to follow me no matter what, even if everyone else left, You'd stay faithful. Do you love me more than these other guys love me? Okay, it, it, who knows? All three are viable. But Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So Jesus says, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And something clicks. As Peter's smelling the charcoal fire at daybreak, he's reminded of a charcoal fire at daybreak when he denied Jesus three times. And three times there's a question from Jesus, do you love me? And it just washes over him and he's grieved. Because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, 
When you were young, Peter, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands. And another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This, Jesus said, to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. Uh, Last week, Pastor Nathan shared the story, the parables of the prodigal son, the lost coin, the lost sheep. And the punchline there is, guess what? The father's got open arms when we're lost. And at Easter, Pastor Nathan talked about lots of things, but one of the things he talked about is Jesus called out Mary, Mary. He knew her by name. He knows you by name, and he welcomed you in. And I think for all of us that have experienced his grace in our lives, we realize, like, his grace just keeps up with our sin. And I read, I read something here that I'll share with you uh, a while ago. It says, there's more mercy in God than sin in us. Isn't that, God? Isn't that good? There's more mercy in God than sin in us. God's grace is, is unbelievable. And the point of Easter was to show us that we did not have to because we could not, we did not have to earn our way to God. God does for us in Jesus on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins, what we could not do for ourselves. So it's not about earning your way back to God. It's not about Peter being ashamed and like, I'll make this right one way. I'll just serve the rest of my life. That's not it. Jesus says, I forgive you. Okay? There's forgiveness offered there. And I don't know about you, but I've done so many dumb things in my life where I just need God's forgiveness. I just need that. And he's offering it. His arms are open. So where does that leave us? Okay. Maybe you're here first time or kind of new to faith and you're exploring it and like, I've done a lot of messed up things in my life. Maybe I just need to get my act together and then God will accept me. Hey, that's not how it works. She says, open arms for you right where you are, right here, right now. Do you love him? Do you believe him? Do you love him? That's all it takes, okay? To be a follower of Jesus. Or maybe you've experienced moments and years of intimacy with God in different ways. Everything used to, you know, you read the Bible and everything just clicked for you. It was like, wow, like, man, this is amazing. You have, you have um, youth retreat, camp experience, small group experiences where there's tears, there's hugs, shivers up your spine, the whole bit. And you went back to your life and you lost that touch with God. And right here, right now, your pathway, if you're listening, God's still speaking to you, okay? He's inviting you back to himself and just says, hey, hey, I know you messed up. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Yeah? Then follow me, okay? So, when you feel like it's too late, okay, God still knows you by name. Simon, son of John. I don't know if he's got a middle name. I guess they didn't have middle names. It was like, Simon Alexander. (laughs) No, he's Simon, son of John. Like, God still speaks calmly and personally. There's no public shaming from Jesus. He just welcomes us in, warms our hearts to himself, uh, and just says the more honest we are with him, the more deeply that forgiveness kind of sits down into our soul. That's that's beautiful. Uh, He still, just like he gave Peter this job, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, all that. Like he gives each of us a personal role. So he still calls you into a personal role. And we all have different roles in the kingdom of God. Uh, Some of us are uh, phenomenal bakers, let's say. That's not me. Um, The potluck last night was on point. So whoever, you know, put that together, uh, cooks, you know, that's awesome. Um, Or maybe you're gifted in prayer. There's someone from our church that regularly prays for me. And uh, the way he does it, on his drive to work, okay, he's got a landmark for different people that he prays for. And my spot, man, it's so cool. Every time I drive by the spot, I'm like, ah, oh, as if he prays for me here. You're headed down um, 
Park Hill headed uh, west, down the hill to Esso and uh, in Domino's. That's the spot that he prays for me. How cool is that? Um, people have different gifts, different things that God's laid on their heart, different roles in the kingdom of God. He still calls you into a role. Maybe you have the gift of hospitality, uh, invitation, pe making people feel welcome. God's still calling you into that. And God still commands us to follow him in a personal way, regardless of what other people are doing around us. And I won't share, but uh, later in John 21, um, there's this rumor that like Peter's going to live forever. And Jesus kind of squashes that like, hey, what's that to you? You follow me is, is what he says. What's that to you? You follow me. Just stay on track. It's not too late to make things right with him. That, that's the bottom line, okay? It's not too late to make things right with him. And it's probably not too right, late to make things right with people around you that you need to ask for forgiveness of, okay? If you're a parent and you feel like, man, I've blown it, it's probably not too late to make things right with your kids, or with God in that realm, maybe in your marriage, you know, it's like sometimes we just, we think that ship has sailed and it just hasn't. God gives us grace and meets us in that moment. So um, to close here, um, what, is a, what does a fresh start look like? Well, it's not earning your way back to him. There's, uh, when Jesus says, follow me, there's an invitation to like, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, see how he lived, and try and copy that, okay, in our lives. And what's beautiful is even though Jesus is now in heaven preparing a place for us, he's left the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, uh, to comfort us, to guide us, to lead us into all truth, so we're not stuck on our own, like, hey, just figure it out. Like, the Holy Spirit leads us into the next step, okay? And there's tons of people in this church that would love to come alongside you, like, experience yesterday with different men that would love to mentor you or, um, you know, talk, go for coffee. Uh, women that would be eager to do that. Like, we don't have to do this alone. Let's, let's support each other and journey towards him together. And uh, two, two final thoughts. Okay. Jesus asked that question, do you love me? And you could, you could hear it in a different way. It's not like, hey guys, like, you love me, right? Like, do you love me? Jesus is not needy, okay? Like, please, like, I've had this Snapchat streak with you for so many days, and like, it's like 11 o'clock, and the snap's not come through. Like, do you, lo you love me? No, it's not that, okay? God has existed before us in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Beautiful relationship of love. He created us for his pleasure, and so we can enjoy community with him. Yeah, he doesn't need us, but he loves us. And he led the way in love for us. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. A gift comes to us. So he leads the way in love. God's not asking us to do something that we, uh, that he's not willing to do himself. Okay? So God loves us first. And finally, um, earlier this week, I, I hadn't talked at all with my family about this topic, but uh, my son, Lucas, he's headed out the door to go to school. And he just asked me this question. Do you love me more than I love you? Isn't that cool? Do you love me more than I love you? I'm like, oh, buddy, yeah. Yeah, I do. And someday, maybe if you're a dad, bud, you'll understand. Um, but that's, that's our question to God. Hey, do, do you love me more than I love you? And he's like, yeah, every time, every time. So follow me. Let's pray. Uh, thank you, God, that you uh, pour out your grace even when we don't deserve it. Lord, your arms are open for us to turn back to you. Soften our hearts, God, to uh, even in our frustration, our agitation, uh, to see what you're trying to say to us. And Lord, this, mo this morning, this week, if we have to make things right, Lord, help us to make things right with you, people around us, as much as it's in our power.
forgive us, God, for the ways that we've sinned and fallen short. That we receive your grace. Please work in us. Lead us into the future. Help us to follow you. Give us your Holy Spirit's guidance in our lives. We pray all these things in Christ's name.